the subjects we are focusing on today is uh, asset restitution in France. What are the solutions for Syria? So indeed, in the context of the vote of the first uh, asset restitution mechanism in France, uh, we wanted to take advantage of this opportunity to bring together uh, reflections as well as developing ideas to uh, um, end concrete solution on how um, to restitute the stolen asset in a particular, particularly complex environments. So by a clever coincidence also, uh, interestingly, uh, the debate around the implementation in France of uh, a stolen asset restitution happened at the same time as the appeal hearings uh, in the, in, in the um, Rifat al-Assad case initiated by Sherpa. So uh, the purpose of uh, this discussion is uh, basically to learn more about the historical landmark uh, cases uh, about uh, ill-gotten gains and particularly the, the, the cases we brought against, against Rifat al-Assad and the crucial issue of asset restitutions. So I'm very happy to now present the leading experts that will provide the way forwards uh, by outline, outlining avenues for a further reflection on how to restitute stolen assets um, by, among other, uh, the former uh, vice president of Syria, Rifat al-Assad, in today's uh, benighted Syria. So uh, to, to begin with, I'm happy to introduce uh, Sarah Brambeuf. Um, she is the head of uh, Great Corruption and Illicit Financial Flows Advocacy at uh, Transparency International France. So she is responsible for uh, Great Corruption and Illicit Financial Flows. Uh, she works more particularly on the question of the restitution of ill-gotten gains uh, assets, the fight against money laundering and tax transparency. In charge of the monitoring and coordination cases of the so-called ill-gotten gains and foreign bribery in which the association was a civil party, Sarah also works on the recognition and redress of the damages suffered by the victim of corruption. So I'm very happy also to introduce Jennifer Triscone. Uh, she is legal advisor at Trial International. Um, she is uh, the so sorry. Uh, so she's a legal advisor uh, of the International Investigation and Litigation Department. Uh, Jennifer is a qualified lawyer in Switzerland. She holds a bachelor and a master's degree from the University of Geneva, as well as a certificate in transnational law. And she uh, um, mostly focuses on uh, Syria and has been uh, really uh, involved in um, the, the, the case that is uh, initiated that has been initiated in Switzerland uh, against Rifat al-Assad and uh, this is uh, the reason why we are very happy to have her to uh, yeah, shed light on uh, this aspect of uh, the, the, the issue um, uh, of the, the, the blood crimes um, that are often the, the, the other side of financial crimes. I'm also happy to, uh, to, to hear uh, today um, Mazen Darwish, uh, who is the director of the Syrian Center uh, for Media and Free Expression. He is a preeminent Syrian human rights lawyer, journalist, and director of the Syrian Center of Media and Free Expression. He has worked for many years on human rights, freedom of expression, and freedom of press in Syria. So, uh, after this introduction, uh, sorry, Laura Rousseau, uh, she is uh, my colleague at Sherpa. She is the head of illicit financial flows program at Sherpa. So she is a legal expert specialized in international and European law. Um, she worked during four years in the field of money laundering and terrorism financing prevention for an important public institution. So uh, having introduced all the participants, uh, and I thank them again to uh, have uh, accepted to join the, this panel, uh, we can start maybe by saying that uh, the road to the, cre to the creation of a stolen asset restitution mechanism in France has been uh, indeed uh, long and sinuous. Um, so we'll have the, the, the occasion, the, the chance to briefly uh, go through how we started uh, to target the issue of stolen asset recovery in France by initiating, along with uh, Transparency International 
France uh, the first ill-gotten gains uh, before French justice. So uh, following this introduction, we will talk about the, the, the specific case of stolen asset restitution uh, to Syria by uh, presenting the case uh, Sherpa brought against Rifat al-Assad that led to the seizure and confiscation of assets amounting to nearly 90 million euros in France. Uh, as um, So uh, yeah, uh, um, Laura will uh, um, uh, provide uh, in-depth um, um, presentation on the particular particular case uh, we brought uh, in, in France. Um, also, as I said earlier, as financial crimes and human rights violations are often intricated and often also the two sides of the same coin, uh, we'll continue further with an intervention of Jennifer Triscon from Trial International uh, uh, Trial, uh, who will develop on the procedure against Rifat al-Assad that is ongoing in Switzerland for um, war crime regarding the, the role he, he played in the Hama massacre. We will, there, we will then hear uh, Mazen Dawish uh, to learn more about the Syrian context today and the possible avenues uh, for asset restitutions in countries where uh, governance is uh, um, basically uh, failed and uh, in the absence of a uh, rule of law. Finally, we'll discuss the step uh, we took uh, in the fight against international corruption by introducing our procedure procedure concerning ill-gotten gains in Lebanon and open the, the debate on the question of reparation by discussing the critical issue of the notions uh, of the notion of uh, victim of corruption. So uh, just briefly, as I said, and to introduce the, the, the subject, um, the road to the creation of a solid asset uh, me uh, restitution mechanism has been indeed uh, very long and uh, paved with uh, obstacles, successes, and deceptions. Um, Ill-gotten gains uh, should be understood as, as, as uh, the assets, movable and immovable property, financial products, bank accounts, etc., acquired in, the, in a territory, well, in this case, in France, uh, to launder the proceeds of unlawful activities or conceal financial crimes including corruption committed uh, in, foreign, uh, in foreign jurisdiction by politically exposed uh, person and or their rela relatives and damaging uh, public institution and the population of uh, such jurisdictions. Uh, so uh, the, 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 the saga, the ill-gotten gains saga started um, uh, early in uh, 2007, uh, where Sherpa uh, partnered uh, with uh, Transparency International France and also at the very beginning uh, NGO CCFD to address this, this issue and figure that, that the very first step uh, was basically to use uh, the legal leverage we had uh, we had in France uh, in order to um, have the French justice uh, recognizing the phenomenon of ill-gotten gains uh, through the application of uh, French criminal law. So basically, our strategy back then was to file uh, complaints. Uh, the first one was filed in two thousand and seven uh, in the so-called ill-gotten gains case with. Um, which concerned, concerned uh, suspicions of concealment of embezzlement of public funds by a member of the ruling families of Gabon, Congo, Equatorial Guinea, which were closed uh, before being relaunched by Transparency International France uh, and uh, carried on uh, later on by uh, uh, Transparency. So the objective was to obtain the condemnation of the targeted foreign officials, but most of all, obtain the seizure of all properties and assets by French authorities. So at the end of a long judicial saga, one of these cases, uh, some of these cases, sorry, resulted in an uh, unprecedented decision. The first one uh, I want to talk about is the conviction, conviction of uh, Théodore Obiang. Uh, son of the president of uh, Equatorial Guinea, by a judgment uh, issued uh, on 2007, um, 
So uh, that led to a seizure of a tremendous of the tremendous wealth he, he gathered uh, on the French uh, territory. Uh, followed um, other uh, ill-gotten gains initiated uh, along with uh, Transparency International France concerning uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, we launched another uh, case uh, on ill-gotten gains uh, targeting foreign officials in Canada um, and uh, also uh, concerning uh, the the, the, the misappropriation of uh, public good uh, in Djibouti. Um, so um, the, the, the last case uh, we, we, we launched where it was, uh, was the one uh, on uh, Djibouti. And uh, later on uh, this year, uh, we uh, changed, uh, more or less changed uh, our approach by uh, considering uh, the case of, uh, of Lebanon. So uh, in order to uh, provide um, in-depth um, um, uh, explication on uh, the issue of asset restitution, I I'm now happy to leave the floor to uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah Brambeuf from uh, Transparency International um, to, uh, yeah, in order to have uh, um, more uh, in-depth knowledge of uh, the issue as well as the, the judicial saga um, that we uh, carried on in France. Sorry, we cannot Sarah, hear you. Sarah, uh, we cannot hear you, Sarah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Very good. Okay. Okay. I removed my headphones. So no, I was just uh, <laughs> I was just uh, thanking you for inviting me today. I'm really happy to to discuss this really important subject. So I, I would like to start with um, with an observation, which is that restitution of stolen assets, of confiscated stolen assets, stands at a crossroads. Uh, indeed, on one hand, uh, we know that restitution is paramount in the fight against illicit financial flows. Uh, it sends the strong message that crime does not pay. On the other hand, uh, restitution is also key to finance uh, sustainable development. We know that every year um, a large amount of money is stolen in the, from developed countries, from developing countries, sorry, and hidden in Western countries. Recovering uh, this amount of money and returning it to developing countries is really key to uh, fight poverty um, and finance uh, sustainable development. And on the third end, uh, when restitution benefits the population that suffered from their leaders' corruption, it also sends a firm message that, uh, that corruption is not a victimless crime. And in that sense, restitution can repair the harm that was caused by corruption. So restitution stands at a crossroads between the fight against illicit financial flows and impunity, between the funding of sustainable development and between the reparation of the harm that was caused by corruption. Each of these roads is important. However, um, we notice that most countries tend to forget the third road, the reparation road. For instance, um, when you look at restitution processes abroad, past or ongoing processes, you may notice that in some, in some processes, um, the returned assets, the return money, is labeled as development assistance funds. In such cases, you can't, you can't detect, you can't uh, have access, you can't uh, identify the origin of the funds. You can't know that those assets, this money was confiscated because it was stolen in the first place. In other cases, you may also hear critics from citizens or from civil society organizations regarding the allocation of the return money. When, for instance, this money is used to finance roads that leads nowhere or towards, financial, uh, towards presidential palaces and that does not reach the, the population in the end. Uh, those cases I, was, I, I just described all miss the reparation goal. And missing this goal 
is really uh, dramatic because it undermines the whole uh, asset restitution processes. It creates distrust and it reinforces the vicious circle uh, of corruption and embezzlement. Um, this is the reason why we need guiding principles. We need um, those principles um, to frame and, and to guide restitution processes. Um, those principles are transparency, accountability, inclusion of civil society organizations, um, the guarantee that the return money won't uh, benefit those who committed the offense in the first place, etc. And here there's a good news and a bad news. The good news is that these principles, they exist. Um, they were adopted in 2017 in Washington, D.C. Uh, at the Global Forum on Asset Recovery. Uh, during this event, uh, 10 principles for disposition and transfer of confiscated stolen assets in corruption cases were adopted. And those are principles of transparency accountability that I was uh, describing before. The bad news is that these principles are rarely implemented in practice. Um, in 2021, we still witness restitution processes where the general public don't have access to the most basic information of a restitution process. They don't have access to the memorandum of, of understandings, uh, the agreements between the asset holding state and the, the, the state uh, of origin regarding the modalities of allocation and use dis disbursement of the funds. They don't have access to uh, the monitoring modalities. They don't have access to uh, the criteria, the criteria for the selection of uh, projects or uh, programs or the intermediaries involved in, in the process. So uh, this observation, this, this constatation is, is it's kind of uh, sad a bit, but uh, it's useful because it help, um, it help us, French civil society organizations to uh, to conduct an advocacy with regard to the French bill creating a, um, a repatriation mechanism. Uh, in this context, and during the past, um, I'd, I'd say five years, we strongly, we strongly advocated for the inclusion of these principles into the future French mechanism. And we succeed. Um, we now have, I mean, we are about to have, because uh, the bill will be adopted at the end of July on, on the 21st, normally. But we now have a general framework enshrining those principles. I think this is um, the first uh, asset restitution mechanism in the world to really enshrine um, those soft law principles. This is a great step forward. But it's not enough, <laughs> as always in, in these cases, the is in the detail. So uh, it's not enough, and we will need to, to continue our, um, our work, our advocacy, to ensure that uh, in addition to this general framework, we will have concrete modalities, technical modalities, budgetary modalities, to make sure that those principles concretely translate in practice and ensure that this money won't fall back into the, um, the corruption um, circles, but will benefit the populations in the countries of origin. So there's uh, other uh, momentum to come. Um, uh, really technical and, 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 and concrete momentum, uh, for instance, the budgetary law for 2022 and other, um, other uh, technical uh, uh, legislative and re regulatory vehicles to really uh, uh, define and, and precise those modalities. And I would like just to, to, to finish on, on, on this um, on these last words. Um, so I hope we will have an ambitious uh, French mechanism for restitution. But even if it's not perfect, we will have um, uh, strong cases, uh, Equatorial Guinea, Syria, to really continue our efforts and, and convince French authorities, but also authorities uh, in the countries of origin of the need of, of, of a transparent mechanism and accountable mechanism and a mechanism that would include civil society organizations in France, but uh, most importantly, uh, from the countries uh, of origin. So um, I hope I made my myself clear. But if you have any question at the end of the webinar, if we if we have time, I would be happy to to answer. Thanks. Thank you very much, Sarah. And uh, yes, yeah, so we'll we'll leave uh, um, some uh, room for the questions at the end. And uh, of course, uh, feel free to uh, ask your questions uh, on the uh, in the chat. I'll uh, I'll um, um, ask the questions uh, at the end. 
So uh, thank you very much, uh, Sarah. Uh, we can now uh, uh, move on the, the, um, to the subject, uh, Syria and ill-gotten gains litigations against Rifat al-Assad, a textbook case for the restitutions of ill-gotten gains issues. Uh, so we'll first uh, start with uh, Laura Rousseau uh, presenting uh, the ill-gotten gains case against uh, Rifat al-Assad. Um, Thank you, Jeunesse. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everybody. So, as introduced by Chanez, our NGO, Chapa, has long been uh, interested in the subject of ill gotten gains, and hence we developed a strategic litigation regarding this subject. And this is how the the Rifat al-Assad al case started. So, after reading press articles about ongoing discussions for the freezing of the Assad family assets in France, Sharpa noticed the disproportion between these income sources and the value of Rifat al-Assad real estate. It became apparent that they had been fraudulently acquired. Consequently, Sharpa decided to, to dig into the case and after some investigation, Sherpa filed a complaint on September 2013. The investigation revealed serious suspicions of money laundering involving millions of euros from public funds embezzled at the time of the exile of Rifat al-Assad from Syria in, 1940, uh, in 1984. Um, so, he is accused of, of building a fraudulent real estate empire in France estimated at 90 million euros. What is complicated in this case, as in most uh, financial crime cases, is that Rifat al-Assad does not hold this asset directly for the most part, but through nominees or offshore companies which makes very difficult to prove the illicit origin of the assets. The, the first hearing uh, took place in December 2019. Rifat al-Assad uh, was sentenced by the Paris court to four years in prison and for money laundering and embezzlement. His assets were confiscated, and, but Rifat al-Assad decided to appeal. The public prosecutor requested the confirmation for the first intense decision during the appeal trial, which took place in May, and the deliberation will take place in September. Um, this decision is of particular importance in the current Syr Syrian context and underscores the importance of establishing a framework for the asset restitution. And this trial also opened the possibility to erode more and more every day the feeling of impunity that the public figures responsible for money laundering, corruption, embezzlement were benefiting from until now. Um, it was quite short, but I am also uh, disposable to answer to the question at the end of the webinar. And uh, thank you very much for your in uh, attention. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Laura, for this uh, very uh, interesting uh, um, uh, view on, on the, the Rifat al Asset case, uh, at least the, the financial uh, aspects of, uh, of the, the judicial proceedings uh, initiated in Europe against Rifat al Assad. Uh, so now I would like to uh, leave the floor to uh, Jennifer uh, Triscone from Trial to uh, learn more about uh, the, the, the ongoing procedure in Switzerland on a, a very uh, different ground, uh, targeting the, the violations of, uh, of human rights. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much, Anez. And so hello, everyone. And thank you very much once again to, 
to Sherpa for organizing this webinar and allowing me to, to participate. I'm very glad that I'll be speaking alongside other experts on the importance of assets restitution, focusing on, on the Syrian context. Today, I am going to focus my presentation not on asset restitution, as we have real experts <laughs> on this question in this panel, but I'd, I'd rather talk on the link between the financial crimes uh, and the international crimes, the case of Refat al-Assad in Switzerland, and also the difficulties posed by investigations and procedures of this scope. Um, so firstly, the interesting links between the blood and the financial crimes. So in the course of the various investigations we are leading on international crimes at trial, we quickly understood that the commission of those serious crimes usually requires significant financial resources to purchase weapons, to pay salaries, to pay bribes, to go through checkpoints, for example, to obtain permits, et cetera, et cetera. And in parallel to prosecute international crimes for what they are, namely crimes against humanity, war crimes, genocide, and torture, it's therefore necessary to question the source of those funds and to try to cut them off at the origin to prevent further crimes or at least to render their commission more difficult. One other thing is that it's usually very difficult to prove international crimes. Therefore, looking at financial crimes can sometimes help to hold the perpetrators accountable. And the examination of financial flaws can also provide sometimes a better understanding of the commission of those international crimes and the perpetrators involved in those crimes. The link between the crimes, the financial assets, and the perpetrators are also very important in order notably to lead the authorities to eventually seize or freeze the assets. And this could actually prevent someone, so for example, perpetrator, um, to leave a country, but also to prevent the commission of future crimes, or at least to render it more difficult, and to allow victims of international crimes to eventually obtain reparations at some point. As I mentioned before, um, international crimes generally goes along with uh, financial crimes. So what about the specific case of Rifat al-Assad? So Rifat al-Assad is actually being investigating by the Swiss prosecuting authorities for his alleged participation in war crimes committed in Hama in February, 1982. The context in Hama is particular. So there has been a long history of assaults on Hama by the government armed forces as the city has traditionally been politically active in favor of the opposition to the regime. And at the time of the event, the opposition movements were growing in Hama. And basically in February, 1982, uh, the government armed forces surrounded and attacked the city in order to destroy this opposition. One of the leading forces that attacked Hama was the defense brigades led at the time by Rifat al-Assad. Those military operations lasted around three or four weeks, during which intense attacks against civilians took place. And heavy consequences have resulted from these attacks. There have been several tens of thousands of deaths. The, the city has been destroyed in most parts. And it's actually an event that marked the Al-Assad regime and which actually already drew the lines of the future opposition in Syria. In November 2013, what happened is that Rifat al-Assad was spotted um, at an hotel in Geneva. The information was given to Trial International by a source. Um, after receiving this information, basically the team immediately begins to investigate the case and collect open source information on the suspect and its alleged participation to the Hama massacre. Based on this first investigation, a file has been built and a criminal complaint filed in December 2013. In this criminal complaint, Trial International underlined the fact that at the time of the massacre, Rifat Al-Assad was the commander of the Defense Brigades, one of the main armed forces used to fight the opposition movement in Syria by the government. The Office of the Attorney General in Switzerland opened an investigation only a few days after the filing. In light of, and I'll be quoting this, suspicions documented by reports and press articles that Rifat al-Assad as commander of the Defense Brigades 
was involved in murders, acts of torture, extrajudicial executions, rape, bombing of civilians and hospitals, acts aimed at starving the population and destruction of cultural property committed during the siege of the Syrian city of Hama in February 1982, which lasted about a month. Therefore, and since December 2013, Rifat al-Assad is under investigation for war crimes for his alleged participation to the Hama massacre. And between 2014 and 2020, five different victims decided to join the proceedings, and the names of many witnesses were shared with the Office of the Attorney General. Since 2013, the investigation is ongoing and trial continues to submit evidence to the Office of the Attorney General. And to do so, uh, many missions on the ground have taken place in about 10 different countries, those missions um, being essential to collect the testimonies of victims, survivors, witnesses, and insiders. And to find those potential witnesses and victims, the collaboration with Syrian partners, some of which are present today, uh, and diaspora is just essential. And although the case is still pending before the prosecuting authorities, extensive investigations have been carried out by trial and its Syrian partners in order to obtain the referral to trial to, to Rifat al-Assad. So how could trial file a complaint against Rifat al-Assad for crimes committed 31 uh, years earlier, being 2013 at the time, and abroad? Um, it is because of the principle of universal jurisdiction. Um, and just to give a brief context about universal jurisdiction, uh, universal jurisdiction is classically defined as a legal principle allowing or requiring a state to bring criminal proceedings in respect of certain crimes, irrespective of the location of the crime and the nationality of the perpetrator or the victim. And the rationale behind this principle is simply the idea that certain crimes are in their very nature so extreme and horrendous that they are perceived to be crimes against all humankind and not just a state or a specific individual. It's therefore assumed that the prosecution of these crimes is in the interest of the whole international community and that a state that takes such an initiative acts on behalf of humanity and not out of its own national interest. Now that does all state recognizes the principle of universal jurisdiction, the answer is no, uh, because universal jurisdiction is a very controversial concept and its exercise raises important questions about, for example, the sovereign equality of states, the non-intrusion into domestic affairs, and the principle of separation of powers uh, within democratic states as rulings of domestic courts become a factor in interstate relations. So universal jurisdiction is basically where international law and international politics walk a fine line between their respective words. And in practice, law follow politics and not vice versa. And it actually matters because it means that even when you have the right case, the evidence, even a willing prosecutor, you may not have the political forces behind you. And so a case can be stalled, but it can also be dismissed, etc. So coming back to, to, to Rifat and the challenges, uh, the, the question that one can ask is, how is it possible that actually the case is still under investigation after almost eight years after its opening? Well, basically, when dealing with universal jurisdiction cases, NGOs, human rights defenders, and criminal authorities face many challenges and difficulties, and I'll just list some of them. Um, maybe the first one would be lack of political will, especially in the case of high-profile suspect like Rifat Al-Assad. Um, there could also be potential issue of immunity depending on the official function the suspect is or was holding at the time. Another thing is the, of course, the specific conditions that surround the principle of universal jurisdiction. Uh, the presence of the suspect is required in most jurisdictions that recognize universal jurisdiction in order for that principle to apply. And I take the example of Switzerland, where basically the jurisdiction of the Swiss authorities over crimes committed abroad is established the moment the perpetrators enter in Switzerland. And the federal criminal court confirmed that the presence requirements must be fulfilled at the time of the opening of an investigation, which is quite a short time. But therefore, this, this means that the subsequent departure of the suspects 
will not put an end to, uh, for example, Switzerland jurisdiction in that case. And it's actually what happened with Rifat, who basically left Switzerland after the opening of an investigation. Another challenge is, of course, the access to justice for victims and survivors of international crimes. First, they should have knowledge of the proceedings, and they don't necessarily hear about the proceedings. So how can victims and survivors be made aware of the existence of open criminal proceedings and investigation? Fortunately, through Syrian partners, the, the civil society, it's possible, but it's always a challenge. And second, the difficulty to travel to testify for some of them is real because of many different reasons. It can be an ongoing asylum proceedings, it can be the COVID, we know that uh, too well now, uh, which, may, which, which makes sorry the traveling very difficult at times. Um, and third, the security concerns. Um, and there's notably the issue of anonymity, where basically a lot of victims and witnesses who want to go forward um, and explain what they've been through, being able to, to expose what they lived, um, they, they are usually confronted to this issue where when they will be asking for anonymity, it will not automatically be granted. And the conditions to issue anonymity are usually pretty high. And the consequences of not granting anonymity could actually prevent the participation to victims and survivors to proceedings. But above all, it can put some of them at risk. Finally, um, and I'll try to be quick, um, there's also the question of the remote investigation. Um, Evidence collection is actually quite challenging uh, in cases of international crimes, and notably where access to the field is not possible. And Syria is a typical example. Um, and if we take the example of Hama, uh, the crimes are, well, one, remote in terms of distance, but also remote in time. I mean, the massacre has been committed now 39 years ago. Uh, so the memory fade, uh, there are also difficulties to collect the evidence. Um, and there was no media coverage at the time because the city was locked in, in some ways. Um, and the, the authorities are also um, confronted to very differ, different cultural contexts. And for example, they will have to try to understand the way the army and the paramilitary units function, for example, in theory, but also in practice, the history of the city, the origins of the armed conflict there, et cetera. And, and we can see that in, I mean, thousands of kilometers away, it's not always easy to put those consideration uh, in priority for the prosecuting authorities to be able to understand the, the scope of the case and its importance also for, for the civilians there. Um, finally, the, the security, of course, is very important, uh, physical, but also digital. Uh, physical for the victims, the survivors, and the witnesses and their families. Notably, when some of them are still living in the countries when the crimes occurred. And for the investigators, in some cases, also, uh, I'm thinking about the field missions, for, for example, to collect information that can be uh, pretty dangerous. And digital, because, for example, when conducting interviews online, you have to ask yourself how to make sure the con connection is sufficiently secure. What about the surveillance? How to ensure sufficient uh, data protection, what about data breach, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, the resources, uh, financial and human. Financial, because with regards, for example, to domestic authorities, for example, they have to create um, work grants units and allow them sufficient funds to function it and be efficient, and that is not easy. Um, and human, because actually a small number of prosecutors are dealing with those cases. And they're basically overwhelmed with the number, but also the dimension of such investigation. Um, and there is also, unfortunately, a lack of spe specialization and expertise of the prosecutors in some cases. Um, and last but not least, uh, the great importance of mutual legal assistance between the states, which is impossible in some contexts like, like Syria. So those are just examples of, of the many challenges that one face when dealing with universal jurisdiction cases, and which could, in some parts, explain why those investigations are taking so long. But despite all of these challenges, I truly believe that universal jurisdiction remains one of the most important tools, as it's sometimes the only available path for victims of international crimes to access justice and to hold perpetrators um, accountable. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer. Thank you. Um, I am now uh, moving on uh, and very happy to hear uh, Anwar Albuni. Uh, so, um, indeed, Anwar is uh, a lawyer. Um, he's a um, Syrian lawyer, um, prominent human rights uh, defendant in Syria. He's one of the founder of the Syrian Human Rights Association and uh, of a center for uh, the defense of journalists and political prisoners. Uh, particularly involved in uh, in defending uh, the question of human rights uh, in Syria. So, uh, uh, Anwar, um, I'm happy to uh, give you the Hello, room to... Hi. Hello. Uh, hi. How are you? Uh, thank you, uh, Shanez, and uh, for Sherba and uh, uh, to invite me and uh, launching this webinar. And thank you for, ev for everybody joining us uh, in this webinar. Uh, yes, uh, the, the uh, Rafat Assad case in, in uh, France and in Switzerland, and there is one in Spain also. Uh, uh, it's so important uh, because uh, uh, this guy, after 30 years, uh, 40 years now uh, almost, uh, and the Syrian feel it's it's hopeless to to. Uh, accounting these uh, uh, criminals. Uh, and uh, uh, when we start in Germany to following the criminals uh, against humanity and all criminals uh, in the Syrian, uh, after civil Syrian revolution, always somebody asked what about Rafat Assad, why it is uh, still uh, outside bar and still outside jail, and why nothing happened against him. Uh, while all the evidence, all the truth, all the fact, proof he committed the crimes against humanity and war crimes in Hama, at least uh, massacre uh, in, in uh, 1982. So it's so important. And I will, uh, uh, Jennifer, uh, uh, explain everything about the uh, the cases in, in uh, Switzerland, and I think uh, Sherba uh, explained what happened in uh, uh, France. And I will spoke about two things. I think uh, uh, first about the case in Spain. Uh, also, uh, now there is about uh, 800 million uh, under siege in, in uh, Spain, uh, uh, belong to Rafat al-Assad. And uh, there is a decision from obfuscation just uh, uh, excuse Rafat al-Assad and his wife and sons and uh, uh, employees uh, uh, to uh, commit crimes uh, uh, and uh, laundering money of crimes against uh, uh, coming from crimes. So uh, for the uh, pacing thing I want to speak to uh, restitute the money. This is a problem, I think, the big problem we faced it and discussed it uh, with the uh, prosecutor in Spain, and it's, uh, uh, we, we're concerned about it. Because the legal side or the legal principle said uh, the Syrian government have right to uh, request this money. This is uh, the law. So we, we have, uh, uh, we, we concern really about this point specific because uh, they have right to request this money from the court and uh, uh, we don't know what the uh, response of the court or the uh, authorities legal authorities in france while we uh, i discuss uh, this point uh, specific with the judge in in spain and i told him if the uh, uh, decision will charge Rafat al-Assad and this money will back to Syrian government, I will not be part of that because it will be uh, used to kill more Syrians. Uh, uh, so uh, keep it in Spain and with Rafat al-Assad better to go to Syria and use to kill more Syrian and destroy more of uh, uh, our homes and, and uh, uh, country. But uh, uh, judge uh, promise uh, uh, it's no way to uh, bag this money to uh, this Syrian government. And uh, maybe when the political solution will go on and will be new government and transitional uh, period, 
maybe it will be uh, uh, up to uh, deal or, or or discuss this this uh, point uh, i don't know what the uh, ability for for uh, the uh, justice authority to do with this money who can uh, request it who uh, if there is any way to the uh, judge or the court or the legal authority uh, release this money for another way in another way uh, that what you uh, you can ask us uh, answer us about that uh, I, I i think there is example give uh, give us uh, uh, give it now uh, example i don't know if it will be uh, going uh, uh, in, in every way uh, in every case uh, that's what we can we must to do on it uh, it's impossible to uh, allow to this money to go to the syrian government now and that it's uh, so important uh, to us and that me make, make our work go uh, as benefit to this killer now in damascus uh, it will be a big problem to to uh, to all this work to be to support killer we we catch one one uh, uh, killer and uh, in, in other hand we support killers uh, uh, still kill and still destroyed and that's problem uh, i think maybe if we can uh, uh, encourage the victims from Rafat al-Assad to uh, uh, create or establish organization uh, uh, can uh, be present, represent the victims and can be uh, represent the, the uh, people who uh, uh, have damage uh, beside, be, 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 uh, without look if they are represent in the court or not. Uh, and this organization maybe uh, it can uh, uh, request to have the money to uh, destroy it for the victims or to another way to uh, serve the damage who make from Rafat al-Assad. I think this is the way, the one way who uh, that we can uh, do something in, and help the uh, court and the authorities to find way don't support the uh, criminals uh, uh, more i i don't know what you your mind about that what your idea about uh, about this way if it's possible to do uh, we can help to uh, uh, collect uh, the, the victims and uh, uh, make uh, establish like this organization and they can uh, request to, to have the money from, uh, uh, I discussed that with Spain and they will come with this idea. Uh, we, start, we started to work on this point. I don't know if it's in France uh, like that, we can do that and uh, the legal authorities can, can uh, uh, respond well with this idea. Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, thank you very uh, much. Can... Thank you very much, Anwar. Thank you. And I suggest on the on the the the, the avenue you uh you you suggested that uh, later on maybe we can have a uh, uh, a discussion on that uh, probably also with the uh, uh, Sarah Brambe from TE uh, um, to yeah to uh, uh, see uh, how can that be doable and and interesting. Uh, in, in the particular case of, uh, of Syria. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I will now uh, pass, uh, pass on to um, uh, Mazen Darwish uh, to uh, give us uh, more uh, uh, details on the, the, the Syrian context and the, 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 the ways and avenues uh, we could um, um, uh, consider uh, for asset restitution. Um, of uh, Rifat al Assad um, in Syria. Thank you very much, and thank you for uh, all the speaker and for the invitation. Actually, I think, in, in especially in the country like Syria, this is a very important step and very uh, sensitive at the same time, uh, because as uh, maybe all of you mentioned, uh, we can. Uh, separate uh, Rafat and his crime from the regime who exists today. So we are talking about 
the same authority, the same regime, and even the same family. So it, it, it could be very shocked and silly if we took the money from Rafat al-Assad and give it to Bashar al-Assad. Where uh, uh, some scenario like this, it, 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 it seems like a nightmare and uh, maybe it's better if we keep it with Rafat. This is the, the only scenario we have. It. And I think, uh, yeah, this is very important and sensitive, uh, especially for the victim. And for this, I think uh, here is our duty as civil society, as organization, local or international, to be sure about uh, manage the expectation of the victim. Because through the, uh, the great and the wonderful uh, effort uh, through the universal jurisdiction or the extraterritory jurisdiction done last few years in Europe, I think uh, uh, there is a lot of expectation and there is a lot of sometimes of false news provided uh, 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 to the victim. And we need to, to understand that we are talking about a war and the crime still exists. Now we are, while we are talking, there is people killed and tortured and disappeared uh, uh, from the Syrian government, especially, and her forces. So this is very emotional uh, uh, situation. Uh, so manage the expectation, give the uh, victim and the Syrian audience uh, respectable and easy uh, legal information. Sometimes uh, we give the information as a lawyers, uh, we knew uh, in advance what the expression means and all of these details. But this is not the same way for the uh, victim and the Syrian uh, audience in general. Manage the expectation and give the correct and, and the right information. And uh, here, so it's very important to recognize that why this uh, case, and in France especially, and even in, in Spain, uh, why this uh, money be able to recovery uh, how this is about money laundry, about uh, tax issue, not about the war crime directly. This is, I think, all of these details, it's very important. And we face this uh, challenge every day with the Syrian uh, victim. In this uh, way, what we can do in, in, in this money as civil society, I totally agree that the victim the direct victim of Rafat al-Assad, they are the most important. But also when we are talking about destroying the whole city of Hama, when we are talking about thousands and thousands of, of victims, not only in Hama, even before uh, 1982, uh, we knew that uh, Rafat is responsible about even execution more than between 600 and 1,000 of the prisoners of Tedmore prison in, in, in 1980. So we are talking about a huge number of, of victims, thousands. So how we can uh, specify who's direct victim of, of Rafat, who's really can be uh, benefited from this uh, money and who's also uh, Rafat or, or his uh, family, his, his uh, sons specifically uh, involved in, in, in stolen their money, not only the war crime, not only the torture, the killing, but they also through years and years, they stolen the money directly from the Syrian. They work also in, in, in heritage issue and uh, there is a huge uh, line of, of crime made from Rafat and his son. So how we can identify the direct victim, what uh, their right, and how we can use this money not only for Rafat crime, because now Syria, when we are talking between 18 and 1982 and today, there is unfortunately now every meter in, in, in Syria, there is a disaster and there is a crime. And the regime uh, not only destroyed Hama, destroyed the majority of the country, and we are talking about millions of victims, not thousands now, 
So how we can use this money, not only for the crime made in 1982, but for the whole crime, how we can use this money for documentation and uh, to, to, to be sure that people victim now, especially after 2011, they are not will become numbers not like the victim in 1982. Unfortunately, in that time, uh, as also my, my colleague explained, there is no media coverage, there is no uh, uh, human rights organization working in that time, especially inside Syria. So how we can be sure that the rights of the victim now, today, after 2011, also will be documented in, in, in very well way, how we can ensure that the strategic litigation in, in several countries, not only in Europe, uh, can be supported, and specifically for the World Crime Unit and the uh, police who's working in, in these cases. We knew from the experience in Switzerland, and Jennifer explained that there is also uh, also in Germany, in France, in, 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 in all country, we have, we try to, in Netherlands, in all country, we try to raise this kind of a crime. That uh, the police unit uh, need resource, need more men, need uh, more uh, translator. Uh, there is uh, a huge number of files on their disk, but they don't have enough capacity. So also, how we can use this money to uh, support uh, this uh, work, which also we can't go to, 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 to the court or we don't have, we can't have any uh, cases if this uh, unit doesn't work in, 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 in good way. All of this uh, question, how we can, we knew also that this type of crime, uh, war crime, crime against humanity, uh, will, will, will not unfortunately solve and stop in the Syrian content. Maybe it will take 10, 20, 30 years. So how we can save the narrative of, of, of what happened in, in, in Syria, how we can uh, not allow to these uh, regimes to, 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 to hide the truth, how we can uh, minimum allow the victim to tell their story. The, the, the narrative issue, it's very important because I'm afraid um, if we don't take care about this, we will become all of us a uh, member of ISIS, as the Syrian regime uh, said. Me, myself, I mean, after uh, uh, spent four years in the, in the, in the security service uh, prisons, I find myself in the court as a terrorist, it's 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 happened and it still exists until now. Uh, so the narrative issue: how we can save the memory, how we can uh, uh, keep this fight uh, ongoing and fight back. This is also very important. I think um, um, to have a, a special uh, organization. Uh, uh, special institute, special work to support the wonderful work from the Syrian organization and also European uh, uh, organization. All of these uh, should be um, uh, on the table, but also the most important, I think, how we can make the victim and the, the, the Syrian society involve and present things and facts in very transparent, and in very direct, honest way. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you, Sherba and uh, International Transparency for this wonderful work. After 15 years, oh, this law exists in France and this is a start point. Thank you all, also Jennifer and the wonderful work from Trial. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mazen, uh, for this uh, very uh, uh, interesting and and uh, yeah, uh, uh, 
a heart shattering uh, uh, testimony you you gave us on on, on the the issue. Uh, so um, now I'll, I'll uh, we'll move on to the uh, where to head the uh, next uh, part and uh, present the. The newest uh, ill-gotten gains case uh, we launched uh, uh, earlier this year, this year, sorry, concerning Lebanon. Um, so I'll leave the, the, the floor to my uh, colleague, uh, Laura Rousseau. Thank you, Shanez. I see that uh, Lilia have a, a, has a question, but maybe we we wait for the the, the end of the of the panel. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, I, I thought that was the last speaker. Sorry about this. <laughs> okay. Preferably, if you don't mind, uh, just a bit for the, the end. Sorry. Yeah, so uh, I, I will, uh, I try to, to summarize the, the, our last uh, case, the, the Lebanese case. Uh, so, as we, as we know, since 90s, corruption has been uh, intimately linked to the functionaries of the Lebanese state. And the following exchanges with Lebanese partners and following the Swiss investigation into Riyadh Salameh's assets, Sherpa focused on the massive flight of Lebanese capital since the beginning of the economic crisis in, in Lebanon. We decide to join forces with uh, the collective of victims of fraudulent and criminal practices in Lebanon to file a complaint on April. And this complaint focuses on the acquisition in France of luxury real estate disproportion disproportionate sorry, to the income of many Lebanese officials but also on the responsibility of financial and banking intermediaries. Uh, the French national uh, financial prosecutor's uh, office has opened a preliminary investigation in May regarding the real estate investment of Riyad Salameh, the governor of Central Bank of Lebanon, for criminal association and money laundering. And the bank OD France is also su suspected of having played a role in Riyad Salami French real estate investment at the heart of the prosecutor investigation. So the investigation is already, already revealing the responsibility of financial and banking intermediaries through their failures, they facilitate the transfer of funds resulting from corruption, money laundering, organized crime. As in other cases of ill-gotten gains, our final objective with pr this procedure is the restitution of stolen assets to the Lebanese people and the fight against corruption. And also the responsibility of financial intermediaries is directly linked to the human, humanitarian disaster that the Lebanese people are facing today. And their impunity must be fight at the international level too. Um, thank you for listening. And now I think uh, we can discuss of, uh, about the, 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 the national victim of these ill-gotten gains, corruption. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Laura. Just uh, to uh, yeah, open up the debate, uh, maybe just uh, I'll have just a few uh, words on uh, the notion of uh, victim of corruption and the notion of, uh, of uh, reparation. Uh, because indeed, as we discussed um, uh, today, uh, the first step, uh, the, the, the first step was the, the question of uh, asset seizure. And uh, now we moved on to the question of uh, asset restitution, like returning uh, those assets to the deprived population. However, uh, the one of the significant problem in this issue uh, lies around the, the, the rights of the victim. Uh, so uh, even though uh, now the, the, the urge of uh, building a strategy in fighting corruption is clearly identified as an absolute necessity, both uh, nationally and internationally, uh, the idea um, 
of uh, that it causes uh, damage uh, that uh, triggers uh, reparation is um, is uh, paying uh, paid uh, to little attention um, to, and so are uh, the victim uh, of corruption. Uh, it is um, clear in everyone's minds that corruption is uh, related to uh, underdevelopment and poverty. Uh, studies have uh, um, extensively uh, demonstrate, demonstrated that uh, the, the poor generally suffer the most. Uh, However, uh, now, now we believe that the, the, the main uh, remaining uh, gap uh, in, the, in the subject is um, the, 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 the direct victims and of specific corruption uh, and uh, the, 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 the reparation or the, the concept of uh, reparation. The, basically, the attention to the, the third party that they constitute uh, in a corrupt relationship is, is largely, largely missing. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, we know that uh, corruption scandal scandals, uh, they uh, lead to, uh, um, sometimes lead to uh, fines being imposed on, uh, on companies. And uh, so um, the, 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 the interest, uh, the national interest that is being, uh, that is being uh, harmed uh, by corruption is uh, in a way uh, taken uh, into account. But uh, the, the, the actual consequences on the population and, and, and specifically in countries where uh, uh, governance is failing and the, 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 the state, the, the rule of law is, is not, um, 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 well, doesn't uh, follow the, 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 the same standards as, uh, as uh, other uh, developed countries. Um, the, this question is, is a, really, uh, we believe, um, now uh, the next uh, challenge in the, 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 the fight against corruption. Uh, so, um, yes, as I said, uh, um, the, the, the right to reparation is basically, it's, it's a basic legal principle. Uh, and uh, it, it, it lies basically at the core of a social coexist, coexistence. It's, uh, uh, it's uh, an evidence that uh, when a damage is suffered, uh, it should be, uh, it, it should be uh, uh, repaired uh, by uh, the person uh, responsible. Uh, so reparation is also common in, in, in uh, some uh, areas uh, where uh, the damage suffered is, is collective. Like for example, environmental damages, human rights abuses with some limits um, and consumer protection cases. However, uh, what we observed is that uh, uh, reparation is not uh, a common, absolutely not a common practice uh, uh, for corruption uh, uh, cases. So, uh, however, uh, um, uh, this, uh, the, this issue is uh, explicitly uh, addressed in the, um, within the United Nations Convention Against Corruption in its article uh, 35, uh, which mandates for uh, provisions to enable compensations for damages emerging from corruption. So again, uh, the, 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 the two concepts are, are uh, very different. The, the, the one thing is to uh, give back the money that has been stolen, and uh, an other thing is to uh, um, Recognize that uh, the uh, damage has been caused and that it should it should be therefore repaired. So, um, but what reparation uh, implies is first uh, the recognition of uh, uh, the existence of uh, the damage. So this is uh, the, the the next um, uh, challenge uh, for us, both civil society and and. Um, public uh, uh, share takers is to build a definition for uh, the damage of, uh, of corruption. Uh, and uh, that will be, um, uh, that is a great challenge because uh, as we know, um, corruption uh, lies to uh, poor public services um, and, and has a, a very uh, obvious adverse effect 
on population. But now the next step forward is to uh, is to uh, move toward a legal definition and. Um, Along with this definition, uh, what we need is a, a, a movement toward uh, a, a, the identification of the victims of corruption. Um, um, take it, um, taking the postulate that the victims of corruption and the states are the same uh, entity, I think this is this was uh, what was uh, quite clear from uh, Mazin's uh, uh, intervention is that this is. Uh, this postulate is, is false. Um, it's important to have uh, a, a severed um, 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 intellectual and a legal uh, um, reflection on uh, identifying clearly the victim of corruption and therefore, um, well, continue building um, the efforts towards uh, reparation. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, th th thank you to all of you uh, um, for uh, this uh, very interesting um, 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 interventions. I will now allow uh, the, the audience to ask uh, questions. Yes, absolutely. You can just uh, uh, unmute and ask your question. Lydia. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you very much for this event. It's really interesting. It's not only important for Syria because in Moldova, where I'm uh, well, uh, um, uh, working uh, and living, uh, we had the one billion fraud from the banking system and the victims of this case, uh, th this entire population, because of taxpayers will have to cover that one billion during 25 years together with interest. And the beneficiary of this bank fraud, he's freely traveling uh, around the world and enjoying impunity. So for us, it's, it's really important. Uh, I have several questions, or um, uh, rather to get more in details. For us, it's really important. What is the mechanism? So the president or the son of the president of uh, Equatorial Guinea has been convicted in France. Uh, based on uh, what? On the principle of, of universal jurisdiction? Yes, so France is part of this, uh, recognizes this universal jurisdiction. Uh, and then in continuation, so how did this happen? So uh, the victims of corruption together with TI France and maybe some other attorneys, did they uh, feel a complaint to the prosecutor office or they passed the case, they, they sued in the court, uh, this son of the president of Guinea. Uh, what else? Um, okay, if the uh, court took a decision to seize and then maybe uh, recover these assets, was it referring to the assets on the territory of France or how was this? Thank you. Maybe you said that and I missed, so the point. No. It, it, D yeah. Don't worry. Uh, um, I, I, I think uh, um, Sarah Brambeuf will be uh, uh, very, uh, uh, very well. Will provide you all the answers uh, to these questions if you don't mind, Sarah. Uh, sorry, Sarah. We cannot hear you. Uh, is that better? Yes, very better. No, no, sorry. Um, so just to start, to convict uh, Theodorino Biong, the vice president of Equatorial Guinea, France needs a territorial link uh, because the offense, the, embezz the embezzlement of public funds happened in Equatorial Guinea between actors that weren't French. So the only link we sorry, have... Sarah, are... something that the sound is moving and it's difficult to understand. Maybe closer to the mic. It's really important for us. Sorry. Okay. Uh, is that better? Is that better? Yep. yep. Sorry about this. Yeah. Yes. So, no, no, just I was uh, mentioning the, 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 the necessity to have um, a link between French jurisdiction and the offense. And the only link we had was where the assets located in France. Uh, this is a territorial link. And this is why it is, it is important to understand that France convicted Theodorino Biang not for embezzlement of public funds, but for laundering of embezzlement. The only territorial jurisdiction French uh, justice has in this case relies on, um, on laundering because the offense of money laundering 
happened in France. So this is really important. This is not um, this is not universal jurisdiction. It's really um, a laundering case, and it is the same for Rifat al Assad. This is the same for all the ill-gotten gains uh, cases that are now ongoing in France. Uh, regarding the other questions on how civil society organizations launched the um, launched the case about 15 years ago, uh, French justice has the capacity to to initiate itself an investigation in such cases. However, because of political reasons, or I don't know, a lack of political will, or a lack of financial resources, they often fail to, to do so. So Sherpa, other NGOs, including TI friends afterwards, had to file a criminal complaint. They struggle to be recognized as co-plaintiffs, as victim, if we can say, uh, they had to go in front of the, 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 the French Judicial Supreme Court to be recognized as civil parties. And uh, in 2010, they, they were recognized as such. And now they, they have, I mean, TI France uh, has the status, Sherpa also in the Rifat al Assad case, in the Djibouti case, etc. We have a legal standing in such cases. And this is really important because it allows um, not all victims, unfortunately, but at least French anti-corruption association to have a role, to have a real role in such cases. And that's really important because without civil society organizations, I don't think we would have, have uh, a conviction of of young of Rifat al Assad right now. It would be the same as 15 years ago. Uh, I mean, just a tolerance from French authorities regarding uh, this dirty money uh, from abroad. Thank you very much. Um, um, someone else has a, a question for uh, um, one of our uh, speakers. If not, I'll, uh, I'll uh, allow myself to, to ask a, a question to uh, uh, to uh, Jennifer. Uh, uh, Jennifer, I'll be interested in, in knowing uh, what could be the synergy uh, between prosecuting a financial crime and uh, prosecuting human rights violations. For example, uh, during the, the, the Rifat al-Assad case, we, we really tried during the procedure to extensively present the, 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 the blood crime aspects of the of the, the of the person of the character. Uh, however, uh, obviously the, the, this this was not the, the legal ground of the actions. So of the action we brought. So what could be the the the, the way to uh, that financial crimes uh, drags with it uh, more uh, um, uh, dynamic on prosecuting prosecuting blood crimes? Well, thank you very much for your question, Shanez. It's actually kind of a difficult one, but um, I'll I'll try to. To answer, well, I would say that, um, first of all, money sometimes can trigger the interest of the prosecuting authorities um, in the sense that if they know that they'll probably be able to seize some assets, uh, etc., confiscate, and this, this could be linked to their own territory, this could be an interest also um, to invest the case and do something on the case. Now, I mean, the financial crimes are not always linked to the blood crimes, um, but what could be interesting is that the blood crimes can help uh, depicting also the character we're talking about. Because sometimes, I mean, in those financial crimes investigation, you have those persons, well, not for Rifat, but for others who looks you know, very good. They have uh, big companies. They appear as very good, good and trustworthy guys. And and finally, when you look behind it and you can make a link with the blood crimes, it can help also understand how the character works, the relationship he had, and in what he participates. Um, and as I also said in in the presentation before. I think that really the financial flaws can also help to understand how some blood crimes are happening. And I mean, this is particularly true in, for example, in cases of pillage. Um, I mean, we have different cases of pillage at trial and we basically were able to understand how 
the pillage was happening and who were the actors in the pillage that participated to actually deforestation and, and different kind of human rights violation through uh, the financial flaws that the company that was responsible for the pillage used to you know, sell uh, typically the, um, well, the, the woods it was actually selling and everything. So it can help um, make you understand uh, the rational of the blood crimes and basically the providers of the funds that usually helps for uh, those blood crimes. Because once again, I mean, one cannot really, I mean, do anything without money because I mean, at some point you have to pay uh, the people, I mean, even the militias, uh, the, the people from the regime, I mean, for corruption, you need money to, to corrupt officials, but also non-officials. I mean, so it's just, I think it's really, there are really interesting, um, intrinsect, sorry, links uh, between the financial and uh, the blood crimes, even if it's not always uh, related. I mean, in the case of Rifat, I think that, I mean, of course, money uh, was involved, but he was also able to participate to the Hama massacre because of the position he held at the time. I mean, he was number two of the regime. He had all the means he needed for his brigades of defense. And we know that they had some weapons the other armed forces didn't have just because he was the brother of the president and he had access to a lot of money. So, um, yeah, I don't know if I really answered your question, actually, but these oh, are I elements I thought of. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and also, I'm very interested about what you said on, on uh, pillages and, and the way uh, uh, sometimes uh, financial flows are the the, 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 the rationale for the, the human rights violation to happen. Um, maybe, uh, is there any uh, more question in the, the, the chat or, uh, or among the participants? Um, if not, maybe uh, one quick uh, uh, last uh, questions, uh, question, sorry, to uh, uh, Mazen. Uh, Mazen, you su suggested uh, channeling the money towards uh, reinforcing the prosecution capacity. Um, I think that's a very interesting point uh, you uh, suggested during uh, um, your um, uh, Euro uh, presentation. Um, what what can be done in the Syrian civil society? Like, is, is there room for uh, NGOs to emerge uh, today in Syria? Such NGOs that could uh, carry on this uh, this role of of reinforcing the rule of law. Do you think that is something doable uh, in today's Syria or? Or does it have to go through um, um, like uh, European NGOs? Um. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I said that one of the channel could be the, the mm. prosecutor, uh, could be benefit uh, the prosecutor office and the war crime unit and the police. Uh, I think, uh, yes, there is a Syrian organization uh, could be not only one, could be uh, uh, several. Uh, I mean, we can put together several uh, organized Syrian organization who's focusing in documentation and litigation and uh, the victim rights. And there is uh, today several uh, uh, victim uh, association and the family of, of the victim association also. So I think there could be a group of, of organization who's manage council who's manage this uh, uh, issue not only um, um, one uh, organization but yes i believe that uh, the syrian uh, have the capacity to 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 deal with this to uh, cooperate together on this and again it should be uh, for for specific goals linked to the uh, uh, victim rights and for the documentation and saving the narrative in general. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mazen. Thank you uh, to uh, all the 
all the of you speakers and, and the people who attended uh, uh, this discussion. Um, I'm uh, uh, very happy and thrilled to have uh, gathered uh, such a su su such a beautiful panel uh, to discuss this uh, very uh, critical issue. Um, and if there is uh, no further question, I think that uh, we could uh, call it to an end and say again, thank you very much. And of course, uh, we did not uh, provide any uh, definitive uh, and, and final uh, an answer to um, this uh, tremendous uh, problem. But I think that the, the, the avenue we explored together are, uh, are definitely interesting and can serve as a, um, a, a dynamic towards uh, further uh, reflection on asset restitution and international prime. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.